Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to the Nelson Mandela Foundation. I'm Tsepa Mutegua. I'm going to be your program director this morning. Thank you, thank you. I know it's cold. Thank you for making it. On behalf of the board and the executive leadership of the foundation, together with our CEO, Mr. Silo Hatang, I would like to send a special welcome to our guest, Advocate Anton Duplessis, the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions, our panelists, Professor Sandy Africa and Otila Mungaidze. And of course, would like to recognize our event partners, the Hans Seidel Foundation. If I could do some housekeeping quickly, you all should have received evaluation forms as you came in. Please, after the event, take time to fill them out. We'll really appreciate your feedback. Can we also just make sure that our cell phones are either off or on silent as we are recording the session? And should you need to powder your nose? Yes, some gents do powder their noses. Um, the bathrooms are past the reception. You take a hard left and you'll find the bathrooms. Please do excuse um, the darkness in the bathrooms. We're trying to sort it out. We've got load shedding right now. So especially the ladies' uh, bathroom is a bit dark, but we'll sort that out. Ladies and gents, one of the characteristics that many sub-Saharan countries share, especially in the SADC region, is having adopted democratic constitutions when we relinquish colonialism. Or in South Africa's case, when we navigated our way, some may say by luck, some of us take a big sigh and say by sheer grace, from an oppressive, violent, and racist nationalist administration and an almost certain civil war. However, for most of these countries, including our own, attaining a democratic dispensation along with its institutions has over time proven to be the easier part. We are all battling to entrench constitutionalism. That is the separation of power between the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. And we are all battling to entrench the rule of law, that nobody may be deprived of their rights and freedoms, and that nobody, regardless of their status, is above the law. And so in the tradition established by our founder, we here at the Nelson Mandela Foundation, we battle these complexities through dialogue. We dialogue when we have more questions than we have answers. We dialogue because we seek to set aside fears, preconceptions, and the need to win we dialogue to hear others' voices. So with that in mind, let me once again welcome you to the space of civility, mutual respect, and equality, where those who differ may listen and speak together. With that, I would like to call the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, who's going to unpack the work of the foundation in KZN post the July unrest last year and the implica implications on the rule of law and constitutionalism. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Silo Hatta. Thank you very much, uh, Tsepan. Good morning. Um, I, I, th I thought I should maybe do some uh, uh, more of uh, the protocols. Uh, I see one of uh, our board members, uh, Alice Brown, um, welcome. Um, thank you very much for coming through. I also saw that they will let me walk in. I th I, there we go. I, I saw that. And uh, I thought I also saw some of our colleagues from ISS here. Yes. Um, um, so the, well, you are all welcome, and thank you very much for, for coming through. I, I wish I could go land by land because now I can see more of the people I recognize. So I now want to go to the back and. So let me, let me not get that temptation going further. And uh, to also thank uh, Hans Seidel Foundation for again being a partner who we rely on heavily on this uh, kind of subject. I thought to start off today, we should actually kick off on uh, something that we, all of us, uh, sh uh, something that should be weighing us heavily on the soul of our nation, uh, the death of the 21 children. I think it's, uh, uh, we have to, at this moment, also accept that we are complicit uh, in uh, how our nation has been going. We are a nation that, uh, that has a drug and alcohol problem. 
And until such time that we hold the mirror quite closely and deal with that, we won't, we will always just be shocked when something like this happens. Um, it starts with a child who is a, a minor being sent to, a, 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 to go and go to an alcohol outlet to go and buy alcohol or cigarettes. I was once that child who would be sent to go and buy for your uncle, for your mother, for your, and it starts there. And I think uh, it, luck sometimes just gets you to uh, survive something like that. And those children were not that lucky. And as a nation, we shouldn't rely on luck that children should survive something like that. And I'm, I'm, we send our deepest condolences to the families who lost their children, but also we, we send our best wishes to the uh, uh, three who are still in hospital. That the rule of law is top of mind for us right now should be no surprise. In recent weeks, we have seen shocking quarterly crime statistics released. We've had a president accused of criminal activities. We've had a public protector suspended. Finally, after a string of embarrassing bungles, uh, we've had a school principal shot in front of her pupils for resisting tenderpreneurs. A police official unable to respond to an emergency, an emergency call in the absence of vehicles at the station. I could go on and on. Right now, as the Nelson Mandela Foundation, we are in the final stages of wrapping up a project to understand the specific rule of law challenges in KwaZulu-Natal. And this is what I want to say a little bit about today. Of course, the 29th of, July, of June um, is a significant day in that regard. It was on this day last year that the Constitutional Court ruled that former President Jacob Zuma should be jailed. During the first democratic administration in South Africa, from 1994 to 1999, the top priority was to make democracy stick. This is in a context where over and above colonial and apartheid legacies, the social fabric had been profoundly damaged by a decade of intense violence, with civil war in many parts of the country and a deeply rooted culture of distrust in the law and all its institutional enablers. That first administration understood that building trust quickly and creating societal spaces for healing were critical. The challenge was especially severe in the province of KwaZulu-Natal. It was born into the democratic era in the context of, uh, in, in of multiple compromises, including delicate negotiation of the 1994 election results in the province. The war between formations aligned to Inkata Freedom Party and the ANC had ravaged the countryside, and while peace had been negotiated, deep underlying issues and unresolved societal damage were carried into the new millennium. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was only able to scratch at the surface of the province's woundedness, which is our national woundedness. Social bonding and respect for the rule of law in the province have faced other challenges. In rural areas, growing tension has characterized the ways in which the Ingonyama Trust has related to communities. More broadly, the ways in which traditional leaders have extracted wealth from communities and compromise their well-being in deals with mining and other corporations have been damaging. As have the ways in which Zulu identities have been mobilized by inter alia the royal family, former President Jacob Zuma, factions within the province's governing party, and the IFP. Amongst many other challenges, four more demand attention and special mention. Factionalism within the governing party in recent years has manifested in increasingly violent ways, with political assassination a common occurrence. Racialized tensions between communities self-identifying as African and Indian continue to simmer, 
with recurring cyclical waves of public violence at about 36 year intervals. This 1949 was the first, 1985, and the most recent being 2021, being a common feature. Manifestations of xenophobia and Afrophobia are growing, especially in the Devon, in the Devon Metro. These are not unrelated to the various mobilizations of various of um, Zulu identities mentioned above. At last but not least, and last but not least rather, what can only be called systematic sabotage, undertaken as a form of insurrection in response to the imprisonment of former President Jacob Zuma was unleashed in July 2021. The latter became the trigger for a wave of public violence in parts of KwaZulu Natal and Houteng, which unfolded over a week. Shops, malls, warehouses, and factories were looted and many lives lost. Even more livelihoods were ruined. The report of the expert panel into the July 2021 civil unrest has detailed how political, intelligence, and law enforcement failures exacerbated an extremely volatile situation. In the days after the violence was contained, the Nelson Mandela Foundation visited multiple sites in Johannesburg and KwaZulu-Natal with some of our partners. Our focus was to contribute to the cleanup and to provide emergency, emergency food supplies to the most vulnerable communities through our Each One Feed One campaign. Our emergency food relief work continued into 2022 in KwaZulu-Natal and was amplified dramatically in response to the devastating floods in the province in April. It is clear now, in ways that it wasn't before, that many communities in KZN are spatially and structurally vulnerable to the extreme weather associated with climate change. I think maybe I need to maybe pause and just uh, give you an anecdote of, um, of going to, to some of these communities uh, with each one, feed one. And uh, I came back to the team and I said, you know, one of the most heartbreaking things was uh, as you were, were there was a day where we were distributing hot foods and groceries. Um, and uh, on this particular day, uh, you had about 90% uh, of those who were queuing for hot meals being children. 1% um, being uh, men and the balance being women. And, um, and as you walk in to those communities, there was a man who, who I then asked, he was wearing the security police, uh, security um, officer's uh, kind of uniform. So I asked him, why would you be queuing for food, food here when you're clearly employed? You know, and he said, I haven't had food for a couple of days and I'm doing night shift. Um, so this will at least take me through uh, the night. And I think uh, the, the fact that you have a job does not guarantee that you have food. And that's something that we have to also contend with as a nation. And with the children, when you inter interact with the children, they tell you the same story. One, you know, children are the, the most honest, right? So you go in and you ask them, so the floods, did the floods hit you here? Said, no, just a little bit. Uh, the parents are claiming that there was damage, but the children say, no, it was just a little bit. We had to water, but, uh, but then it means that they were confirming that some of the problems that we have have always been there. It's not the floods. The floods just exacerbated what was already a problem. So to better understand the challenges to social bonding and the rule of law in KZN in the wake of July 2021, between November in 2021, 2021 and May 2022, the foundation conducted a mapping exercise in the province with the support of the Old Mutual Foundation. Our goal was to understand better the nature of the challenge and to identify who is doing what. We met with structures of the state, the private sector, and civil society. We visited many communities. 
especially in the Phoenix, Inanda, Nduzuma, uh, Kwamashu area. We participated in three community social cohesion workshops convened by, by the Institute for Africology. The first two had, uh, it had representatives from 11 communities in KZN, and the third was a national workshop with representatives from all nine provinces. What have we learned? Well, of course, we are confronted by the resilient apartheid and arguably colonial patterning in the province, which manifests specially and in every other way. Disturbing levels of poverty and inequality have been deepened by the impact of COVID-19, the country's slow economic recovery from lockdowns, the wave of public violence in July 2021, the economic uh, reverberations of the war in Ukraine and infrastructural damage caused by the flooding. Levels of destitution are disturbing. As are the numbers of households barely able to put food on the table until these patterns are, are shifted meaningfully. The well of desperation and frustration which fueled the events of July 2021 will continue to be in place. Organizations of civil society, NGOs, CBOs, faith-based communities, and, and so on, are doing an extraordinary range of work in KZN. For instance, they've assisted with the emergency relief work. They offer capacity building, mediation, fac facilitation, and healing programs. They provide trauma counseling and they support food security projects. The private sector has also been extremely active supporting civil society initiatives and programs, but also under undertaking emergency relief directly, rebuilding damaged infrastructure, capacitating a small business recovery, and looking for ways of supporting the state in its intelligence gathering and law enforcement functions responses from local government and provincial departments in terms of their own social cohesion initiatives and in terms of their willingness to work with civil society and the private sector have been uneven and inconsistent. Certain structures of the state, including traditional leadership, stepping up to the challenge, but others have not. And levels of trust in the state are very, very low. A recent Human Sciences Research Council national survey, for, in, for instance, pegged trust in the police at only 27%. I was in Germany with the Hans Seidel Foundation about a year ago, no, uh, less about uh, eight months or so. To see their statistics was mind-blowing, that the police, the military, they are competing to be the most trusted. Whether you trust us or not, we don't give a heck. That's the impression that I get of how our structure, structures of the state work. This could even be lower in KZN because of how people have been treated. The fact that none of those involved in the planned and systemic, uh, systematic sabotage in July 2021 have been brought before the courts reinforces this pattern. I think we can call them the 12 disciples because the Minister of Police said they were 12. Where are those 12 disciples? I asked earlier on uh, what's been happening uh, because we at least want someone to, to be held accountable and none have been held accountable at all. So a lot of work is being done, but the structural, systemic, causal factors which underlay the events of July 2021 remain very much in place. Both public policy and political will are proving inadequate in the face of the challenge. New strains are being placed on the deep fault lines. Cultures and practices of lawlessness are rampant. What we are describing is a situation which is if anything, even more volatile than the one with, which uh, was exploited by saboteurs last year. 
it will, it will only take a tremor to unleash the, another type tidal wave. And I think this is a caution that we should all be um, looking out for because it's an important caution. Needless to say, there's no quick fix. And realistically, there may in fact simply not be a fix at all. But what the foundation's work in KZN and elsewhere has demonstrated is that what we are calling a social bonding praxis will be fundamental to finding sustainable solutions. Key attributes to this praxis or this approach are as follows. Within a particular sectoral space, for example, food security or early childhood development or land reform, both a multi-layered network and a shared understanding of common good are built as far as possible from below. You work with people from below, working with community-based organizations and networks of practitioners is critical. The shared understanding is framed, perhaps even defined by a level of trust and a willingness to compromise. Here it has to be assumed that powerful actors are committed to promoting the common good. They might make mistakes, and they will make mistakes. They might get things wrong, but they are open to learning and to being redirected. Many social justice activists, understandably, have given up on working with the state due to the high levels of corruption and other forms of dysfunctionality. But ways can be found of working with even very dysfunctional government departments and local government structures by finding units within them which are operative, by finding individual officials who care, and they're still there. If you look, you will find those kind of people. We've seen how structures of the state, of the state, of civil society, and of the private sector can become both participants and stakeholders. We've also seen how public policy can become predicated on uh, responsiveness to community needs and the voices of beneficiaries, practitioners, and community-based organizations prioritized. What is enabled is a space of interrelatedness and interdependence, an ecosystem in which Every element plays an important part. Ecosystems like this is what KZN needs today. These are the ecosystems the foundation is committed to promoting and supporting. We owe it to those who feel discarded, those that democracy left behind, that those who are still waiting to be delivered uh, into the liberation that we are enjoying today. So I'm hoping that today we'll again begin to respond to Ugogo Lamene that we met, um, that that child that we met in KZN, that we will do something about the plight that it doesn't go back again to what we had a year ago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ndate Hatan. Well, while cultures and practices of lawlessness are rampant, and trust in the state is waning. How privileged we are that we remain in this position where we can engage our country's institutions tasked with ensuring that there is rule of law and constitutionalism is upheld, that we can engage them in dialogue. So without saying anything else, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, who's a highly decorated and experienced prosecutor Advocate Anton Duplessis, who's currently the Deputy National Director of Public Prosecutions in the National Prosecuting Authority of South Africa and heads up the strategy, operations, and compliance portfolio at the NPA. Advocate. Wow, standing behind this podium, knowing that. Uh, our former president, Nelson Mandela, used to speak from this podium and from this chair, having watched many speeches that he's given in this room is a real honor. So uh, it really is an honor to be with all of you this morning. It's, um, and to be speaking on this topic 
in this sacred space, the former office of South Africa's icon of justice and the rule of law. It's great to see so many friends, former bosses, mentors, colleagues, even some family members, and I must welcome my mother, who's actually celebrating her 70th birthday today. Uh, so we can give her a hand of applause. Uh, I thought she uh, thought it might be useful. I think we all need a bit of a dose of inspiration, and there can't be a better place to get that inspiration than right here. And I hope you do find time to take a walk around, particularly to go to Madiba's office, which is just down here overlooking the gardens. I was here a couple of months ago at a particularly difficult time uh, for the NPA, and I left inspired and enthused. The one thing I didn't leave with, though, was a strong voice for today, so please excuse my croaky voice. I, I actually have gone through puberty, and I actually have, my voice has broken, um, but if it does reach a few high notes today, uh, you'll know why. So I was never meant to become a lawyer. I'd actually enrolled for, for BSc, uh, Electrical Engineering, but Madiba's inaugural speech in 1994 on constitutionalism, I don't know, it just, it just hit me like a bolt of lightning. You know, I was a young, clueless 18-year-old, and that speech just changed my life. Because it made me realize that while a functioning electrical system was important, that in fact South Africa's future would be determined and be shaped by the quality of the rule of law. Never would I have known the challenges ahead, both for the consistent supply of electricity, as we saw this morning, and for the rule of law. And unfortunately, many colleagues have been caught up in the load shedding mess and weren't able to make it. But I know there are also um, about 150 colleagues online, so I just wanted to also greet them and say uh, so that we will be taking your questions. But as a senior prosecutor in 2022, I'm really pleased with the choice that I made. Because we might not be the most popular people in this country right now for reasons we can discuss, but we carry an incredible burden and a privilege, and that being to uphold and protect the rule of law, and in doing so, secure the future of 60 million South Africans. I don't think it's an over-exaggeration to say that. I think many people doubt, however, whether we will be able to deliver on this. But I hope that with, this, with my remarks, I'll be able to demonstrate that it's not all doom and gloom, and that the NPA will be part of writing this next chapter of South Africa's brighter future. Now, South Africans have a complex relationship with the rule of law. We always have. It's a notion that was injected into our DNA in 1994, and it has paved and shaped the way of this country in mostly positive ways since then. But prior to 1994, we were ruled by the law. We then transitioned into a constitutional democracy. This includes a set of norms and values that South Africans broadly share, but we're increasingly doubting whether some of our leaders share, that, share, that, share this with us. Now, South Africans set the bar of the rule of law bar very high, and we should. Our history demands this. It's the golden thread that has held our country together since 94, and it's the light that needs to guide, light our path into the future. But in simple terms, the rule of law as spelt out in the Magna Carta of 1215 means that everyone, including the most powerful, uh, do not enjoy unfettered authority and are constrained by the rules that even the state is subjected to. After 1945, the rule of law expanded beyond the application of national law and to, to include international law as well. Now, the rule of law is not just a legal or political theory, colleagues. It's an absolute practical necessity that correlates to higher economic growth, greater peace, less inequality, improved health care, and better education. And unlike some like to argue these days, it's not the preserve of the elite. On the contrary, it's the most important protection of the weak against the whims of the powerful. It's what stands between us and tyranny. And the rule of law in South Africa has been under, is underpinned by a transformative constitution. It's important to just unpack this a little bit. This envisaged a meaningful improvement in the material conditions of people's lives, together with a real change in legal culture. A key aspect of this is the culture of accountability. And Celos touched on it, we'll come back to that in a moment. But as the late law professor Moranik points it out, he said the necessity, uh, he pointed to the necessity of actions being justified, juxtaposing an apartheid culture of authority with a democratic one of persuasion, 
And I'll come back to this theme in a little while around persuasion. But South Africans only, can only be persuaded by the rule of law when it remains legitimate and widely respected across class, race, and political lines. And in recent years, the rule of law has been on a roller coaster ride in South Africa, with some notable successes, especially stemming from some of the trailblazing constitutional court judgments on social econo and economic rights. But there have also been some major setbacks, and let me just touch on a few of them. The first one is the destructive debacle and the backstepping policy proposals relating to the ICC and international criminal justice following South Africa's unlawful hosting of Al Bashir, who was wanted by the ICC for the worst crimes known to mankind. Second is the widespread impunity for TRC crimes, which continues till today, although we are working hard to change this. Sellers pointed to it. The lack of accountability for the planners and instigators of the July 2021 violence, which was an unprecedented attack on our democracy. And the last one I'll mention is the unjustified and vicious attacks by senior politicians against our judiciary in recent months. Now, colleagues, while not, sorry, I think I skipped it. Yeah. Colleagues, despite these setbacks, however, nothing could have prepared us for the full frontal attack that state capture corruption has brought on the rule of law. And that will be the focus of my remarks today. Now, to be clear, the rule of law in South Africa is, being stressed, is not just being stress tested in South Africa. It's under pressure across the globe. It's not just us that are facing strong headwinds. Developments in the UK, the Europe, in Europe, in the USA uh, are not promising. And autocratic rulers across the world are licking their lips at the slow and steady decline in the rule of law at the international and national levels. But the headwinds in South Africa are reaching gale force levels with hailstones and lightning thrown into the mix. And corruption and its most pernicious variant of state capture has done more than just devastate our economy and development prospects, wiping out a third of our GDP. State capture has ripped the heart out of the rule of law in South Africa, which is, central, it is a central ingredient, as we know, to the social contract holding us all together. And the lack of accountability is undermining the legitimacy of the rule of law, and I'll come back to that point of persuasion. We can't be built, a country built on persuasion, as Moranic posits, if people don't have faith in the rule of law system and don't see accountability for those who have tried to actively destroy it. And in this regard, the recent Afrobarometer survey makes for grim reading, and Acela has pointed on one of the statistics, but I'll just touch on a few others. Almost two-thirds of South Africans say that corruption has increased in the past year. 72% believe that officials who break the law go unpunished. Only a minority of South Africans say they trust the president. It's 38%. And only 27% of South Africans trust parliament. A majority of respondents indicate little or no trust in the judiciary. And trust in the police is at 27%, as Sela points out. Now, state capture made this much worse and has contributed to it. And the reason is because state capture is an attack from the inside. It's a stealthy but lethal war raged against the rule of law by the very people who are meant to be supporting it and protecting us. And colleagues, these people almost inflicted a fatal blow to the rule of law. But fortunately, South Africa is a resilient nation. People from all sectors stepped into the firing line and took a bullet for the future of the country. And I'm speaking about many people in this room, many people online, I'm speaking about people from civil society, the private sector, media, the legal profession, of course, many brave colleagues in government. And we owe them all a huge debt of gratitude because we came close. We've seen recently just how close. And this brings me to the role of prosecutors in, and the NPA in keeping the rule of law alive in South Africa. And let's just touch a little bit on why prosecutors matter. Now, the rule of law demands not only the protection and promotion of fundamental rights, but I've already said it demands that those who exercise public and, public and private power are held to account for their unlawful actions. Prosecutors are the lawyers for the people of this country. People expect us to ensure accountability is the norm and not the exception. And in recent years, we've let our people down. This must change. This is changing, but it needs to change faster. But before I get into this, I need to make a very important point and be clear. 
The NPA is not the panacea to the state capture crisis, as many would have us believe. Colleagues, we cannot prosecute our way out of this problem. We'll come back to that in a moment. Corruption has seeped into all the hidden nooks and crannies of our country. And like a powerful stream, it flows around and over most obstacles. It's become a way of life, just the way things are. And it's mostly to be expected at all levels. And this invisible presence at so many levels is what makes it so damaging to the rule of law in this country. Indeed, the final part of the Zondo report has shown that sustainable success against corruption and state capture will require a strategic and whole of society approach coordinated at the highest levels and implemented at all levels. And I think, Silla, this is something you're also touching on in terms of your bottom-up approach. It must be led by brave South Africans who are prepared to fight for the future of this country, not hedge their bets against it. The fight will involve our Chapter 9 institutions, it will involve our private sector, it will involve our regulatory bodies, it will involve our professional bodies, including advocates and bar associations, and yes, it will also involve very important political reforms. There needs to be a multi-pronged defense against these future, the future threats of state capture, and importantly, an owning up on the part of many that helped make it happen in the first place. It's easy to point fingers at the NPA and the police right now, but it's not going to get us out of the mess. And it's also potentially a dangerous red herring. But this said, the NPA does have a very important role to play. And I know Tilly is going to pick up, pick up on this issue in her remarks. Because we are gatekeepers of the criminal justice system and arguably its most powerful officials. We must lead efforts to ensure accountability. And public frustration at the pace of progress um, is reached boiling point. People are yearning for accountability in this country, or orange overalls in local parlance. The NPA must deliver on these expectations. We must do so quickly, and of course we must do so without fear and favor. It is our main priority for the coming months and years. But we also need to manage expectations. Prosecuting corrupt, complex corruption cases is notoriously difficult endeavor across the world. It's a global problem. The main reason, and we can discuss this, but the main reason why prosecuting relates to the nature of the crime, which often involves multifaceted and, and is also transnational. But very importantly, it also involves powerful figures within the public and the private sector. And one lesson for me over the years working in over 20 countries in Africa on this issue is that when law and politics collide, the law very seldom comes out in good shape. And it's something we must be aware of in South Africa and mean we must ramp up our fight in this regard. Now, this reality is on steroids when it comes to state capture. Because these characters wielded not only the traditional powers of organizing serious criminals and racketeering networks, many implicated in state capture also controlled the power of the state, including the intelligence and law enforcement structures. And Professor Sandy Africa knows more about this than anyone else. And they used this power to instill fear and spread misinformation. And the recent Zondo report has shown just how this allegedly happened. Now, let me speak a little bit about the road to recovery. The NPA got a new leader just about three years ago, Advocate Shamila Batoy. She took over as the NDPP in February 2019. Slowly but surely, she appointed a new team of leadership around her, including her deputies like me, and a number of provincial directors. I rejoined the NPA in, last, in, in March last year. I've been with the NPA under the, in its former heyday under, in the early 2000s under Bulalain Luka, who's, who's thankfully with us today. And at that time, the NPA was an inspiring place to work. We had the Scorpions, we had swagger, we had confidence, we had passion, we had our mantra, which was we were loved by the people and feared by criminals, and we really were. Um, I don't go around saying that in the organization too much these days. But the rule of law was in full flight, and we had the wind at our backs. And the, that time is a reminder of where we aiming to be and what was possible. But it's also a reminder of the lessons that need to be learned. With the wind at our black backs, we flew too close to the sun, and the rest is history. But we've taken important lessons from this, and we can speak about it if there's time and questions and answers. And for those of you that haven't read Bulalani's book, he spells it out very clearly about how that path and that journey was taken. It's a, it's, it's a really interesting read. Now, under the leadership of Shamila Batoy, 
We've been hard at work and we are proud of the progress we have made. I'm going to speak a little bit about that now. Yes, a lot more needs to be happened, but it must be remembered that it took 10 years to undermine, to capture and undermine the NPA. It's going to take more than three years to rebuild it. And we still have many excellent prosecutors in South Africa. Don't, read, don't believe what you read in the media. We have some of the best prosecutors in the world. And together, we are fighting our way out of the hole that state capture threw us into. And we, we know that this is a long-term project, akin to building a house brick by brick, waiting for the cement layers to, the cement to harden before building the, uh, putting, laying the next level. But let me highlight just some recent successes that will hopefully leave you with some sense that the battle for justice in South Africa is not yet lost. To start with, and this is going to sound like a, a, a sort of trite banal point, but it's really important, the NPA today is more independent for legal and other reasons than it has ever been. And I say this emphatically, and I'll look anyone in their face, including the 190 people online, no one controls the NPA. No one controls Shamila Batoy or me or the leadership. We're not beholden to any politician. We're not beholden to any public, uh, in, uh, private sector interest. And most people know that. And I'll come to that point in a moment. We are committed to our independence, and I challenge anyone to test us on it. And I mean anyone. The next point is that something that's not noticed because of the media narrative, but impunity is no longer a given in this country. The ubiquitous taps of rent-seeking and corruption have been turned off. The seminal corruption cases that you've seen brought to court in the last few months demonstrate this. But there's an irony to this progress. The irony is that this progress is part of the reason why people are so depressed in this country right now. There is a violent and dangerous contestation for political space and patronage taking place. And those who fear justice the most are ramping up their attacks on the rule of law and the system underpinning it. You know why? because this system is scary and, and unsettling for them. But this contestation for space is scary for us to work. Constitutional democracy, democracy are seldom peaceful or easy. So we should not see what we're seeing now necessarily as a, an example of a failed or failing state, but as an example of a maturing state with a system of rule of law built on 25 years of constitutional experience coming together to demonstrate to those that want to capture it again, that it's going to be a bit harder this time. I would be more concerned if nothing was happening, if the political contestation was smooth, if no one was fighting for that space. And they would be doing that because they didn't fear the independence of the NPA. And let's just bear that in mind. We'll come back to it. But our task, colleagues, is not just the short term bringing to justice and orange overalls those that have committed state capture. And I'm speaking to the people in the room and online for your support on this. Our, our task is also to strengthen and redesign the institutions to minimize the risk of state capture happening again. And while there may be some quick fixes and we must focus on them, we need to focus on the longer term project of fixing South Africa's public and private institutions. And while there are important, these important and laborious processes are underway. Care needs to be taken to explain these realities to the impatient public who are being, how do I say this nicely? We need to be, tell them what's being done so that they don't lose faith in the process and be tempted to follow the voices of populism. That's what happens in, in, in moments like these, in maturing constitutional democracies. Conveying this message is something I hope that all of you in this room can assist us with over the coming months and years. But let me conclude with some specific examples of progress and then I'll wrap. I'm going to just give three and then I'll go into work around the ID. The first one that you might not have realized, but that is important to know, is that we've secured significant additional funding, both through the political support from our minister, but also through partnerships. And we've hired hundreds of new prosecuted, prosecutors and engaged on priority reforms that have been shelved for years. We have ramped up the NPA skills development process with extensive specialized training and bespoke capacity building initiatives. A number of a key focus of this is inculcating a culture of courageous leadership in the NPA. When I go back to the early days of, of 2000 and Bulani, one thing we didn't lack was courage. We made mistakes, but there was a sense of courageous leadership. Fear has infiltrated the criminal justice system and the civil service 
we need create courageous leaders, and we're partnering with Oxford University and others to create a program to build courageous leaders in the NPA. We've become bold and innovative in terms of our partnerships, both with civil society, the private sector, and our international partners. But I don't want to bore you with these longer-term reforms. I know you want to see action. Orange ovals, I get it. So let me speak a little bit about that. But for the astute observer, you might have noticed that in recent months, we have arrested and, arrested and charged a number of high-profile state capture suspects. And there are many more to come. And I know a lot can get lost in the media noise. And these days, everyone's laying criminal charges against everyone every single day. So it's difficult to keep up. But if you just track it and go onto our website, you'll see a number of seminal cases. The architects of state capture are no longer roaming the streets uh, freely. They are before court. And South Africa is a world leader in the time it's taken to bring the former head of a ruling party to trial, or even to imprison a former president. I wonder how long we'd see to take, the, see, take to see this level of progress in many other countries, but including the USA, UK, and France. So we're very hard on ourselves, but I think sometimes we just need to take that step back. Um, we've also arrested a number of alleged senior policemen for PPE corruption, and that's very important, because if you can demonstrate that you can actually arrest the people that are your counterparts within the system, it demonstrates a, a, a level of confidence in the progress we're making. And then, of course, there are these two relatively unknown brothers that were arrested in Dubai recently. And I can assure you, again, despite what some of the media might be telling you, that we're working with the leading team in the country to make sure they are brought back professionally, make brought, sure they are brought back appropriately, and that their due process is respected in the UAE, because we don't want that to become an issue when it gets back to South Africa. So we do need to do this carefully. As much as people would like us to be trumpeting our success from rooftops, that would be a bad legal strategy, in my view. But our sharpest arrow in our anti-corruption armory is the investigative directorate. It's leading our state capture work. And under the new leadership of Andrea Johnson, I know some people have said the idea has waited for Zondo and done nothing, but that's not true. We've actually arrested 65 high-profile people brought 82 uh, cases to court, and there are a number of trials ongoing, with many more coming within the next three weeks. And the idea is gaining effectiveness. And there are lots of reasons for that. But I do want us to bring this up possibly in questions, question time. It is not the erstwhile scorpions. The idea is far from the scorpions. And there's a reason why that is. In my view, the, the, the decapitation of the scorpions many years ago was what started the process of state capture. You'd be very careful in terms of how we analyze that, but I think it's time now to look at bringing back some of the aspects of the scorpions to the ID, particularly in the context of prosecution guided investigation. And we are working very hard with that on this issue with Parliament and the Minister. And, and I really think you should watch this space, particularly if you're a criminal, because it is something that is going to be quite concerning for you in the coming months. Now, <laughs> accountability is not just about seeing people in orange overalls. It's also about hitting them where it hurts most. And South Africa is a world leader when it comes to asset forfeiture, both civil and criminal forfeiture. And we really have moved a lot. In the last year alone, we've frozen 5.8 billion rand in assets. Now, that's more than the NPA's entire budget. So for those of you that were wondering about where your taxpayer money was going, you can relax. We actually froze more money than our entire budget. So uh, we're doing OK on that front. But it's really important to recognize that. But Accountability is not just about people in jail. It's a whole range of things. I know Atelier is going to pick up on it, so I won't go into too much detail on it. But I want to end where I started, by drawing on the inspiration of this sacred place and the father of our, of our nation, who led us on our rule of law journey. And I want to quote from that lightning bolt inauguration speech in May, 10 May 1994, where he says, we enter a covenant that we shall build a society where all South Africans, both black and white, will be able to walk tall without fear in their hearts, assured of their inalienable rights to human dignities, dignity, a rainbow nation at peace with itself and the world. If Madiba was speaking to us from this podium tonight, today, I think he'd be saddened by the state of this covenant in 2022. He would, be, he would have expected better from all of us. He would have hoped that the rule of law would be entrenched and respected by all our leaders. And he would have told us so firmly, but lovingly, but he would have saved his sternest words for those of us that are giving up hope on the transformative power of the rule of law in our constitution. He would have reminded us that the arc of history bends towards justice, and that it's the responsibility of all of us to fight for this goal. 
The people of our rainbow nation can only walk without fear in their hearts where they are, when they have confidence in the rule of law, that it will protect them against arbitrary abuse of power, including the ravages of state capture corruption. Sadly, fighting for the rule of law has become a dangerous and fearful endeavor for many people. But please know this, the leadership of the NPA is not afraid. We will not let Madiba down. We are committed to once again becoming an organization that puts justice first, that makes accountability the norm, not the exception. <coughs> and we will keep fighting until we become the prosecuting authority that South Africans and Madiba can be proud of. And I know that we can rely on the support of all the people in this room. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, Advocate. Um, you know, those who know and have worked very intimately with Nelson Mandela here at the foundation say that he could be very, very persuasive. So we'd like to thank Dada for changing the advocate's career. A loss for science, but definitely a win for the rule of law. And as Advocate uh, has already highlighted, we in South Africa have set the rule of law bar very high. So we all in this room and those of you who are joining us online have the opportunity now to hold each other accountable. And uh, the next item in the dialogue requires us to contribute and participate. The discussion will be facilitated by our CEO, Dr. Silohadang, but before that, let me just uh, again introduce uh, Professor Sandy Africa as well as uh, Ms. Otila Munganidze. Professor Sandy Africa has a history of involvement in the democratic movement, working in the South African Security Services and in Ministerial Services. She holds a PhD in public management and was appointed as an associate professor in political science at the University of Pretoria. And she currently serves as a deputy dean for teaching and learning in the Faculty of Humanities at UP. Ms. Otila Munganidze, please pardon me, is the head of special projects in the office of the executive director, the Institute of, for Security Studies, an international law and human rights advocate. Ms. Otila works towards promoting human security on the African continent by advancing peace and justice. Dada over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think Okay, thank you, Professor. Perfect, thanks. Okay, so. good, good morning, um, no, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm blocking my, the mic here. I hope you hear it. You can hear? Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for the words of introduction. Um, and thank you for sharing with us um, uh, the experience of going to uh, work with, see with, experience with the people on the ground uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. Thank you also, Advocate uh, Deputy, for uh, giving us that reassurance that the rule of law is alive and well, under threat and under attack, but um, there are people in institutions who are striving to ensure that it um, is strengthened, it grows, and the purposes for which it was so uh, firmly established in our constitution uh, remain solid. And, and um, we really salute and wish you well in your uh, quest uh, for justice in, in that regard. Um, my, my re responses to your uh, inputs are framed to an extent by my experience last year as one of three people who were appointed to um, give the President of the Republic um, an assessment of what it was that had um, led to the eruption of violence in 
uh, KwaZulu-Natal and other parts of the country, uh, what the failings of the institutions who are there to guarantee our security and safety might have been, and what recommendations um, we had as a panel, myself, uh, Advocate Majanku Gumbi, and the late uh, Mr. Sulumko Sukupa, um, who sadly passed on a few uh, uh, weeks ago, uh, what our recommendations were to actually ensure that our security services could become more responsive, could be actually in a sense, held to account for their failings if we considered what they had uh, failed to do as a, a security failure, and indeed what uh, the executive and other institutions um, had also uh, been remiss in, in, in attending to and ensuring that uh, the people who already live such precarious lives were protected in, in that moment of assault uh, on uh, our democracy. In fact, uh, that report uh, will not be the subject of my discussion today. It's available on the presidential website for all and sundry to see. Um, and I think, um, you know, if I'm to reflect on what we did, uh, many have said that we really just presented, hopefully in a coherent way, what we already knew about the state of um, the security of our people's lives, that uh, in fact it was um, a very precarious one, where safety and security, human security, were not guaranteed. Uh, but in Framing my comments, I, I want to turn to a number of issues that perhaps we, because that was not the purpose of the, of the reports, that was not the purpose of what we set out to do, probably need us to have our eyes on as we engage with the future, engage with our realities. Um, the other stress factors that a society as ours, in transition, moving from, and I know that we all say, you know, we've had democracy for 30 years or so, um, can we not move on? Um, much ought to have been consolidated by now, and indeed it ought to have been. But I think that we also need to have a long view, both backward and forward, to where and how we are shaping this democracy if we are really going to get to, to grips with uh, our prospects for really uh, deepening, strengthening democracy. And so I want to just highlight a number of uh, stress factors which I think that we may not be paying sufficient attention to in our dialogue and in our uh, this discussion. The first is the question of racial justice. Um, now, I use the term as distinct from social justice, and I do believe that uh, we always need to be finding the language and the tools and the, the discourse to be as inclusive as possible in the way in which we frame um, our realities and how we go forward. But um, I do believe that our and I think we all share the view that our continuing high levels of racial uh, injustice and inequality also undermine the rule of law. It's a problem of our own making, but it's also a structural problem. But if we are to not um, address this, if we are to not address a number of key factors, which actually were the structural conditions which made it possible for that insurrection, if you want to call it that, that uprising, that rebellion, I mean, the political actors caused it all sorts of things. Um, it'll just make a mockery of our calls for reconciliation, for a new kind of society. So access to property, access to wealth, access to opportunity remains skewed in spite of our economic oh, and um, employment. Um, EE opportunities, um, 
largely because these laws and policies have not been properly applied. Um, you spoke about the face of poverty that you saw. These persistent patterns of um, poverty, uh, black poverty at that, black African poverty, white privilege, and the absorption of a black middle class into the political elite actually just perpetuate this racial injustice. The neglect of rural areas by policy makers resulting in the massive migration to urban areas, inadequate inability of local economies and local government structures to absorb and provide decent and viable conditions of living. Um, the reinforcement of an apartheid era racial hierarchy where black people, particularly black African women, are at the bottom of the pile, where language and birth put people at a disadvantage, creating the racialized hierarchies that you spoke to, that you saw, and which you say, you know, erupt every now and then. These racialized hierarchies of privilege, in, even within the black community, and prejudice, racial prejudice, uh, deeply ingrained uh, in our communities, uh, in certain communities. All of these are the manifestations that we just need to be able to talk about and address um, the structures that hold these up so that we deal with systemic racism, with racial prejudice, racial injustice. So my question is, how can we make the pain of racism and racial injustice a topic of discussion in a way that is inclusive, that builds our society, doesn't create a defensiveness, and actually promotes justice, promotes the rule of law? Um, perhaps we should be starting in our schools and certainly, you know, in the higher education landscape, by the time people get to those institutions, uh, they should be, uh, you know, we should be alive. We are currently at the University of Pretoria engaged in a discussion about why it is that the, the, the success rates of students are along racialized lines and dropout rates as well. Um, so. My point is that racial injustice is a reality, but we're timid in our efforts to stamp it out, um, and that we should see more of us taking a stand, be it in our corporates, advertising, which is the media, uh, government departments, sports bodies, to challenge it, to stop it, to punish it, to correct it, and in that way contribute. So. Uh, now, the problem is that, I think this is important because racial injustice is actually a manifestation of skewed power relations. Um, in the words of the youth who <coughs> videoed a few days ago the assault on a young person by a much older person who should have known better, uh, who happened to be a, a white man, that youth said, just because you have a gun uh, does not mean you can do what you like. Um, but that is the reality. It is those who have the power uh, who actually are able to continue to actually wield the kind of, um, of, of, of stick over the rest of, of society. Um, but it's heartening uh, to see that there are courageous uh, stands being taken against racial justice. And I would, I suppose, say that um, the one thing I experienced when I walked into the room was that everyone is much grayer than the last time I saw them. So <laughs> perhaps it is really for the youth <laughs> to actually take forward this um, struggle. And I appeal to the young people in the place, and I'm so happy that there are many in this room, that maybe this is your struggle to hold hands and actually think about how we can have those discussions, those critical discussions that will shape and reshape our society. Now, 
I'm sure there are those who belong to a political tendency or grouping called the radical economic transformation, they call it um, grouping, who would say, aha, yes, this is what we've been saying all along. But no, 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 no. There's a big difference between what I'm saying, because what I'm saying is that um, we need to actually contend with our realities, not to instrumentalize them for narrow political gain. And so the next point, and I'm only going to make three because I know that we have um, a little time. I suppose the next issue that I suppose we need to find a way as we discuss the rule of law uh, to discuss is the issue of political agency. Um, what kind of political agency should we be talking about and imagining and um, reinventing perhaps um, certainly the representation, the representational nature of our agency that we've been uh, handed to, uh, that we've received by virtue of our constitution and the rule of law are to be celebrated. Um, and I'm so happy that Advocates has pointed out that the kind of competitiveness is, you know, it's, it's happening all over and societies in transition, be it in Latin America and um, the rest of, of, of Africa and even Europe uh, all have had these kinds of very competitive systems. So any system is going to have its ultra-lefters and its radicals and its ultra-rights and um, those who stand for any number of uh, causes. The question is, what are the rules of the game and what are we going to tolerate? Um, is anarchism or the politics of spectacle as we see so often to be an acceptable part of the tactics, giving halts, to, uh, you know, grinding to a halt at the discussions on urgent issues, uh, such as, as the, the one that we are, are dealing with, you know, of what has happened to our state institution. Perhaps as, as citizens, we ought to uh, insist on better conduct, or maybe not. Maybe we can see through the spectacle and actually uh, vote with our feet uh, for, for what it is. And maybe some of us actually, I cannot assume that everyone in this room belongs to the same political party, has the same political views, and you're entitled to those. Where we draw the line is where you cross <laughs> the law and perhaps those institutions which you know are charged with actually constantly parliaments constantly reviewing our laws and we sending people to them also need to be part of the shaping and reshaping what am I trying to get at perhaps it's just that um, the rule of law when it's written in a book as an edict can be sometimes a deceptively um, kind of straightforward thing, but in reality, our democracy is messy. Um, it looks, uh, you know, uh, we have different expectations from it. Political competition actually results in a ANC here, a DA there, an EFF there, a coalition here all kind of um, uh, balancing out each other in power. And it is really that very rule of law which defines the rules of the political game that we either have to abide by, put our foot down when people don't, or redraw. There's perhaps another question, and perhaps because you spoke about KwaZulu-Natal, we need to be uh, considering, and that is, as we redraw these lines of engagement, what are we to do with traditional structures? They're accommodated within our constitution, um, and yet um, I think we have a very uh, complex relationship with them. Yes, indeed. Um, the academics would say so, so maybe I should not say yes indeed, but some would say that they actually have been part of the process, particularly during the apartheid era, of uh, furthering the agenda of the regime at the time. But it's been quite interesting to see how people in recent 
uh, months have been relating to these structures. The other day, we saw a President Mbeki at uh, his uh, birthday celebrations, and seated next to him was the king of the Zulu nation. Um, now, in my student activist days, I mean, uh, you know, any talk of the uh, Zulu royal family or any was anathema. I mean, the, the only game was the democratic movement, the UDF and the this and that, or, you know, for people who um, perhaps had been involved in the black consciousness movement, that was the name of the game. We coexist with all these political realities. How do we take them on board? At the same time, in a society that is increasingly cosmopolitan, which is interconnected with the, uh, the rest of the world, where there is, among younger people, I suppose, a, a need for a different kind of, of agency and identity. Um, what I'm saying is that the rule of law actually, perhaps, also has to somehow um, recognize and be uh, intertwined with these realities. So it's, 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 it's something that actually uh, is interacting with a social context and reality. And what is that social context and reality? Um, I, I want to perhaps uh, start, I had other points I wanted to raise, but it's not fair to go on. I wanted to talk about our weak and gutted institutions. I wanted to talk about the party state cycle, uh, where it seems that people are moving between the executive, the party headquarters, and business. Um, I wanted to talk about gender inequality and gender injustice. But I suppose uh, it's, uh, I, I could end off by saying that uh, in response to the question of whether constitutionalism and the rule of law are an adequate umbrella under which to tackle some of the challenges uh, which our speakers have laid out, the poverty, the climate change, the food insecurity, the the levels of political uh, instability, the corruption, etc. Yes, yes, and yes. Um, and why? Why is the rule of law so important? Firstly, because we fought for it, um, because people died for it. Um, it's ours, it's our navigational marker for how we actually deal with all these challenges. Also, because it's ours to to shape and reshape, and we actually have the structures to do so. But more importantly, because it protects us from arbitrary rule, it protects us from all those indignities, it guarantees our rights, those rights which are, uh, are, are spelt out in the Constitution, particularly in our Chapter 2. And so, uh, who is to do this? Ourselves as active citizens, we need to hold our leaders to our counts, and it's we need to hold our uh, institutions to account. And uh, it's perhaps very apt that in a venue such as this where uh, you know, we had such shining examples of, of leadership um, that founded our democracy, that we really should turn our heads to the question of what kind of leadership is, is needed to ensure the entrenchment of the rule of law. I hope I haven't meandered uh, too much, but I really just wanted to throw into the discussion a few issues that I think um, could perhaps color uh, the, the conversation in such a way that um, it brings us all the time back to the, the, the realities that we all confront as we step outside the room. So thank you once again for the opportunity, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, and a special thanks as always to the Nelson Mandela Foundation for convening these kinds of dialogues. I have a difficult uh, task. One, I'm speaking last, so I'm speaking after advocate Anton Duplessis, 
and uh, Professor Sandy Africa. So you're probably wondering who on earth is this person? Second, because people want to engage. So I don't want to take too much time in, uh, in making my uh, response to, to the keynote. But I'm going to start first with a question to the audience. Unfortunately, those of you that are online, I cannot see you, but I hope you respond wherever you are. Who here, without quickly taking out your phone, or uh, I don't know, those who carry constitutions, who here knows how many chapter nine institutions there are in the South African constitution? Be honest. You can just raise your hand. Hmm. Ah, there's one hand. How many are, oh, don't have a discussion about it. <laughs> how many are there? How many do you think there are? Eight. Right. The constitution provides for seven chapter nine institutions. At the moment, though there is debate, six are in operation. They are the ones that everyone knows, the public protector. They are the South African Human Rights Commission. They are the Auditor General, the Commission for Gender Equality, the Commission for the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Cultural, Religious, and Linguistic Communities, the Independent Electoral Commission. And while the Constitution provides for an independent authority to regulate broadcasting, it's still unclear whether ICASA serves that function. Why do I start my response by going there? We've already heard from the NPA, so we don't need to talk about them. But I start by going there because the Constitution provides for beyond the existence of the executive, the legislature, the judiciary. It provides for other institutions whose responsibility it is, is essentially to hold people accountable. Different people for different things. Be they the rights, cultural, religious, and otherwise. Be they gender equality. Be they the rights that are fully rights. Uh, or be they the function of the Auditor General. This speaks to a body of institutions that are meant to ensure accountability. But we've heard that accountability is not just about people in orange overalls. And quite frankly, none of these other institutions ensure that people are in orange overalls. But what they do, or what they're intended to do, is they're intended to build trust that we have a state with duties and obligations in respect of us, and that they will actually carry out those functions. It presumes that we want them to carry out those functions. It presumes that we don't need to be told that the rule of law matters, that we're not controlled by the law, that the law is not instrumentalized to oppress us, as was done during the apartheid era. It is perhaps important here to make reference to Professor Morenik again, Anton. In his seminal work on the transitional, then, Bill of Rights, he posed a question as to where we were headed. It's titled, The Bill of Rights, A Bridge to Where. And Professor Morenik underscores a fundamental question that we're struggling with today in 2022. He's not here to hear me speak. He's not here to witness what is happening. But he posed questions as to where we are headed and why these instruments in the Constitution are important for us to get us to that where. What is that where? That where is transformative constitutionalism. That where is a space in which Regardless of who you are, where you are, what you do, you know that those who violate your fundamental rights, be they related to your dignity or even your rights to education and the fundamental rights of children, that they will be held accountable. There is a presumption there, and I repeat this, that there are people who will be tossed with ensuring that accountability, 
that there are people, the law part of the rule of law, that will ensure that constitutionalism is not just a long word that a lawyer says and hopes people understand, but that constitutionalism, transformative as it should be, is something that we actually experience. I say this because there is one thing that everyone has spoken about today, but perhaps skirted a little bit. Trust is so much easier to break than to build. We can speak about the fact that only 27% of people that responded to Afrobarometer survey have public trust in the criminal justice system. But how do you rebuild that? How do you ensure that what has been broken can actually function again? How do you ensure that people re uh, report crime in their areas to their nearest police station and not to a community policing forum or even worse, to vigilante groups? How do you ensure that through actually ensuring the rule of law, that people don't take law into their own hands. That entities like Operation Dudula don't knock door to door asking people to identify themselves, arguing that if you go, we will be able to establish peace, security, stability. There will be no violence, no crime. There will be jobs if you go. How do you ensure that the words, Sandy Africa, that are in the Constitution actually live, that they're not just for me, poor old lawyer working at an NGO, to understand, but that I don't have to go into communities to teach constitutionalism, that I don't have to explain the difference of rule of law, rule by law, that these are things that are inherent and understood. As I end, I promise, Elo, that I would not speak for 10 minutes. I've done seven now. A number of points that I want to stress and underline, words that have been used that we ought to keep in the back of our heads constantly. Inclusivity, transformation, inequality, structural, systemic inequality, accountability, recognizing that there are layers to what we're talking about. There's a difference, let me be blunt, between me picking up my phone and calling my local police station, which incidentally somehow always has electricity, versus a person living at the moment in Mamilodi, in Alexandra, in Attridgeville, in Kailicha, in Guguletu, attempting to get the same level of service. And I am a black woman. At the same time, there's a recognition of existing structural inequalities that Sandy has spoken about that we need to address. And not because I'm a lawyer and not because I had to spend years understanding the Constitution, but precisely because I actually believe that in the framing of our Constitution, in the providing for the various institutions that are meant to ensure that this country is a better country to live in, I strongly believe that we can actually ensure constitutionalism and the rule of law within the South African context. And that it shouldn't be just up to us here in the room, online, wherever you are, if you can see and hear me, that uh, carry forward this message, but in fact, that the people, Silo, that you met in KwaZulu-Natal, when you asked them about how they are doing, why it is they are here and speaking with you, that they understand that they too can be in a better position and that it is through the actual embodiment of that transformative constitutionalism that is through recognizing the function of various institutions to advance a state in which the rule of law is not just about orange overalls. I'd be damned if it were. Thank you very much, uh, 
Cotillia and um, to my other two panelists, uh, thank you very much for, for the provocation. But unfortunately, we have about half an hour left. So I, I, I thought maybe we should, uh, I did get the 15 minute grace, uh, so, so they gave me the 15 minute grace. Um, I was given strict instructions, Kora two, you must finish. So I, we do have until, it's mommy's birthday after all. <laughs> so, so, we can, uh, so I thought maybe uh, before, as you get ready with your questions, I should ask Anton first, the mics are, are, are on, on the floor. Um, I, I want to ask, uh, Anton first to to reflect on the responses. And that I don't think the mics are off. Oh, they're off. Yeah. Um, I hope you heard me still. All right. Um, so uh, I want to start with Anton first to to ask him to uh, reflect on the um, the responses uh, and then go go to the floor. Thanks, Hello. Yeah, very thought provoking, and and for someone who spends uh, long days in 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 soundproof rooms discussing discussing accountability in a narrow sense, I think both of you have really opened my eyes to the the nature of it. I think I did make the point that. I think it's a red herring in South Africa, as you ended on, to, to think that accountability for these crimes is going to be the, uh, the panacea. I do think we need to start somewhere, because the problem is that, and you see it everywhere, you see it on our roads, you see it, it comes back to that question of trust and persuasion. If the rule of law is not respected at the highest levels, it's very difficult to respect it at any levels. Um, and I don't know how many conversations I've been in with, uh, with friends who, you know, small example, you'll have dinner and you, you can see one person's had one or two glasses, too many wine, too, too many glasses of wine, you'll say, so when you're ordering your Uber, and they're like, no, no, I'll be fine. And I'm like, how will you be fine? Well, you know what, if they stop me, I'll, I'll sort it out. And, you know, it's sort of, in, it's, it's just like entrenched everywhere, mm -hmm. this culture. So we do need to create a set of accountability at the top. But I think unless we start understanding what both, actually all of you said, you said it as well, so that how do you make the transformative power of the Constitution, something which everyone can believe in. And I think you mentioned the example of, you're not going to solve South Africa's problems like this. We have a real problem with our, the capacity of our state. We have real challenges we should know about. But if you can find local communities, people that understand the nature of why and why constitutionalism matters to them, and how do they access the very people that are meant to protect those rights in a way that's meaningful to them, that's where we need to start. And it's not always going to be broad-based effective governments. It can be two or three people in the local council who do the work, that take it up to the provincial council, who then get to the... We need to find pockets of excellence in our government. Yep. We need to support them. We need to expand on them. We need to, we need to trumpet those successes from the roots of pockets. Success will breed success. I'd really love to... Uh, you know, it's speaking about when I was with the NPA in, uh, in Bulalani's time. If you look back to what the Scorpions did at that time, you know, people thought that this was an army of prosecutors that had people everywhere. It was this massive force, but it was really small. I mean, Bill will remember, he started the NPA, he didn't even have a desk. I mean, he, he literally didn't. And I joined at our old building uh, when we went there. I mean, it was a small group, a ragtag group of people that were building this organization. We built pockets of excellence, we had good communication, and we created a sense from the bottom up that if you could get to the right person who really cared, you could find your way to make the rule of law meaningful. So I think that's a really important point. And then the last one to, to make is that um, I do think there are real issues that need to be addressed that you touched on, Sandy, about how do, we under, how do we speak about the racial divisions in our country when it comes to the rule of law. And at the moment, you're seeing political parties using that in a very populist way but we haven't got a very good narrative to respond to it, and we need to, because it's cutting right through the middle of the debate, and it's delegitimizing the rule of law in the, only, in the way that only populist politicians can do. And of course, as the NPA, we have to stay out of politics, but it's for people like this in the room that help us with that narrative. So I was really interested by what you said. Hmm. Thank you very much. I want to recognize Ndadembeki uh, sitting here, Ndadembeki, um, I, 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 I I, I didn't uh, recognize oh, you earlier on. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'd like to throw it to the floor. 
if you can raise your hand and uh, if you can avoid giving a speech from the floor, uh, rather ask a question or make a remark so that more and more people can participate. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kiorapi Tisipato. From, uh, I'm a director of Maparata Technical Networks and Signal Power 4.0. My remark actually here is particularly from the NPA, and I'm very glad that Mr. William Nguka is also here. I've been following him also in his progress. The reason why I find this very relevant for me to stand and speak, uh, I've been coming here, last time I was here with uh, Judge Mokoro as well, before COVID and stuff, discussing almost similar issues of corruption, racketeering. And what I want to discuss is, uh, I think the advocate will understand the modus operandi of this whole thing. The reason why I'm saying this is because since from 2012, following the National Development Plan, I decided to move from working for the state. I'm, I'm a former law enforcement agent myself. And then I went for private um, persuasion for business. And the issue that is being discussed in the state capture, some of us, we witnessed all the events at a close range because we were participating in business during that time. And I always say, I remember I once told one of my guys to say, the modus operandi of state capture, it has, as the advocate was saying, it has been, we were, the, paint, the picture was painted to say, hey, the whites are eating alone and everything. And then we have to transform. But in the process of transformation, then we saw a system that gave birth to rampant, rampant corruption, complex and sophisticated way of doing things. That at a close range, even if you want to challenge the state, because those people are working for the state, you, 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 you need to have that compelling evidence against the state. And they always maneuver in a manner that there won't be evidence that is coming direct to them and linking them. And when you do the chain of evidence, obviously to, if you have to prosecute an individual, you have to have that evidence. The prosecutor needs to have that evidence. He won't be telling you about somebody who was sitting in the garage and exchanging half a million with whoever, and then you did not capture that. So all these issues of state capture as it unfolded and we've seen the reports, the challenge is how do we move forward? And definitely if we will uh, say, no, the state capture is done, and there's still those conflict within the system. Other issues intertwine, other issues separate in harmony or in whatever. So the challenge is how do we move forward uh, with these issues that affect it? Because you see, in the center of poverty, it is people who must be economically active. And to, for us to be economically active, we have to work, we have to have businesses, we have to do whatever. So as we are eradicating poverty, and in the uh, legacy of Madiba to eradicate poverty, people need to work. And if people need to work and corruption is at the center, therefore it, becomes, it makes us to lose a lot of money, a lot of, we even be becoming discouraged to, to even sure. just step out of your house to say, I'm going to look for a job or I'm going to look for a business. Thank Fantastic. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, there was a hand here, if you can give that hand, and then Tatembeke here. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Tumbo. I work for the South African Human Rights Commission. Uh, my question, okay, let me give my question first. It's directed at Prof. Uh, Sandy Africa. Um, it's, do you believe there's enough mechanisms to hand over the know-how, to hand over these things that you're saying the young generation should take over. Um, I'm saying that because it's quite clear to me that the younger generation does not have the skills to achieve change. How do we achieve change? And the past generation has acquired these skills. You've achieved the change to a large degree. But we're finding that the amount of violence and destruction of property is showing us that we don't know. We don't know how to, to engage this government. For example, unemployment is a huge issue. Every year, we see the stats come out, but you're not seeing civil society institutions outside of the Nelson Mandela Foundation that are equipped in any way to fight this battle of unemployment. 
how do we look at this monster and go through the courts, for example? We don't have those skills. Uh, so are there platforms, mechanisms that you believe can do that, that can hand over those skills and say, okay, this is how you achieve change in your country. These are the steps you take. This is how you get funding, um, for example. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, panelists. Thank you very much for this very enlightening uh, presentations. Uh, my name is Moelet Mbeki. I'm from the South African Institute of uh, International Affairs. I just want to make two comments. Uh, the first one I I I is that Anton said that, uh, lamented that South Africans don't trust parliament, don't trust government, don't trust the president. Uh, my comment on that is that they are very wise not to trust all those people. Uh, so they should keep it up and uh, they have to prove themselves. Um, so we will continue. I'm one of those who don't trust them either. So we have to continue distrusting them until they can show us that they deserve to be trusted. But the main point I, I, I think I want to make is that in our discussions in South Africa, uh, we have what, I, what is called an elephant in the room. The elephant in the room in, the, in our discussion, and this is a, a very appropriate place to raise the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is what was the objective of the national liberation struggles in South Africa? Because to me, that's what's at the heart of, 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 of the disappointment, which is what is leading to the trust. Uh, the population expected certain things from the liberation struggle. They expected certain outcomes. They did not get those outcomes. Um, I think the professor, uh, Sandy, has put a finger on it about the racial justice. That's what the, 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 the people expected. But what did, they get, what did they get instead? They got the preservation of the social and economic system that was inherited from British imperialism. That is what they got. So, but that's what the struggle was about. The struggle was never about racial justice, was never about equality. It was always about the incorporation of the African elite into the British colonial system. It was about the incorporation of the Africana elite into the British colonial system. If you ask yourself, what were the Africana nationalists fighting for? Their biggest grievance against the British was that the British was constraining them from exploiting the blacks. That is what they were fight. And then after 1910, the British said, here, we hand you over the state. You exploit the blacks, but you deliver the gold and the diamonds to London. And the Africana nationalists were very happy. And they did that from 1910 right up to 1994. We now, and the African nationalists said, what about us? We also want to exploit the blacks. We also want to exploit to benefit from the minerals of South Africa. We fought on your side, the British. One of the things that gets forgotten in this country is that the black elite in this country in the 19th century fought on the side of the British imperialists against the African tribes, so-called. That's why you have your Lovedales, your Adams Colleges, and so those were the rewards for fighting on the side of the British in order to be incorporated into the British colonial project. So the reason the people don't trust the government, don't trust parliament, is because they have yet to demonstrate to them that actually their project is not the exploitation of the labor of the black people in South Africa for the benefit of the middle class and their 
uh, white friends. It's not there. It is for the development of all South Africans. And that is what the black elite has not demonstrated. So far, the black elite has demonstrated that it is continuing the project of colonialism, which is the development and the benefit, the exploitation of South Africa's vast resources and of the cheap labor system that the British developed in the 19th century. And that is what is continuing in South Africa today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I want to uh, start off with uh, you, Anton, um, and then give uh, uh, the, the two of you, uh, and, and as you respond to the question, what next, I want to just, I could hear I'm planting a seed into that uh, question. Mm. There's something called conference resolutions that are coming at the end of the year. Don't you have fears that what you're trying to do to, to try to remain independent, that the conference resolutions will then undo the work that you are doing now? That's the ele my elephant in the room. <laughs> so history doesn't bode well for the answer to that question. <clears throat> I think if you look at what's happened in the lead up to previous con conference resolutions, uh, I think I said the rule of law hasn't, or the law hasn't uh, come out uh, looking very good when it collides with politics. What I can say now is that uh, at the NPA that is not certainly not something we take into account in any way in regarding the very big decisions that have to be taken. In fact, we actively do not discuss or have any uh, uh, consideration given to it. The bottom line is, while we are not political actors in any way, the Constitution says, Section 179, which we have to prosecute without fear or favor, and that's what I made the commitment that Shamila Batoy, myself, and the other leadership are, are in, a, in no way uh, political actors. But that doesn't mean we don't have to navigate the politics. Being a political actor is not the same as having to navigate the politics. And this is a question which has come up many, many times for the NPA. Um, so navigating the politics isn't about a decision on whether we charge or don't charge people. But we do need to understand that in this competition for space, um, there's the risk that the NPA or that you recreate, you, re, you reinvent the wheel now for political reasons. I think that would be a mistake. We have 25 years of incredible lessons learned under constitutional democracy. Mistakes made, lessons learned. We have institutions that are constitutionally mandated. I think the risk, and this is not our decision, this is a political decision, the risk would be to try and reinvent that like has happened in the past and say, we'll create a new system of, of anti-corruption that will be insulated and it will be fine. You start backwards, not forwards. So I think that would be my point is, let's invest in what we have, let's learn the mistakes we've made from the past, but let's not have a knee-jerk reaction to the conference resolutions that might come out at the end of the year and make a huge mistake and take us backwards. I want to come to the point that was made around the Zonda report and, and, and the difference between, and it's very important because there is an expectation that's created that Zonda, and he's done incredible work with his team, 8,500 pages of incredible work, and one of the reasons why perhaps I'm a bit grayer than you saw me <laughs> last time, Sandy, is that uh, I've had to read uh, all of those pages. Um, there's a big difference between what, Zonda is a truth commission, you must not forget that. It has a completely different standard, there's a lot of evidence from single witnesses in there, there's a lot of um, uh, opinions in there. That is not criminal justice proof beyond reasonable doubt. And if the expectation is created that the NPA has got a blueprint for prosecution of all the people in the Zonda report, I think they're about 1,500, that's going to weaken the rule of law, not strengthen it. Because we will do, Malets is right, we, we're not going to build your confidence back quickly if you expect that the Zonda has created a blueprint for us. It's not. We need to go back and we need to investigate, we need to bring evidence to court, we must make sure things are done properly. These things take time. But I also make, want to make the point that Zonda doesn't determine who we prosecute or who we don't prosecute. We are guided only by the evidence, only by the strength of that evidence and by our independent decisions as to what and who needs to be prosecuted for what crime. So, so we are operating in a very interesting and very fluid political environment. Again, we are not political actors, but we, are, we need to navigate this politics very carefully so that we don't become, not we, so that the NPA does not become a victim of the political dynamics, that doesn't affect my job or my future, but affects the rule of law in this country in ways that I think will be incredibly damaging if we in 2022 go back to where we were 10 years ago when the politics determine 
the tra trajectory of the rule of law in this country. So I think you raise a very important point, but it is something just to bear in mind when we manage expectations. But that does bring me to, just quickly to end on Maletti's point, you're right. Let's see, there's no way, we can't, de it's like any respect. Don't remind, you can't demand respect in a marriage, in a friendship, in anything, and most certainly not in this environment. We need to earn that respect, and at least, um, I can't speak for the police or the president or, or, or parliamentarians, but I'm, I'm hoping that what you're seeing coming out of the NPA, this commitment to our independence, this commitment to bringing justice in an appropriate way, will slowly but surely start elevating that level of respect as we go into this next very difficult period that this country is going to be facing. Thank you very much. I want to go to Prof. Um, the, the question is about, uh, about skills transfer, um, but, but I want to add to it, uh, if you can also respond to what Ntatembeki raised, particularly where we co you, you dealt with the issue of race. How do we undo exploitation, continued exploitation? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for all the contributions, questions. I think it really enriches the dialogue. Um, on the question of, um, you know, skills transfer, I think that, you know, you have to take into account that there has been a rather a systematic um, elbowing out of people from state institutions. And so we've lost some critical capacity. Um, they are still good people, but systemically there's just so much that needs to be done to really reclaim the lost ground. That my own sense is that um, it's probably going to take a few very deliberate and strategic insertions of capacity into key institutions, but at the same time, um, a, a recruitment of people with new skills. What we realized during the expert panel work was that, uh, I'm talking now about the security services, that to a large extent the skills base was just inappropriate for what was faced. Um, so people didn't have the requisite uh, IT skills, they didn't have the investigative capacity, they just had no idea of how to engage with uh, this digital reality that is the new form of mobilizing, of uh, engagement. Um, so uh, who, who, who will actually bring those skills into the state? I think that uh, we must continue to encourage people to, in a sense, change the system from within. It comes also, though, to the question of leadership, because you don't have the right people in leadership positions. They're not going to allow that talent to be drawn in and ideally utilized. As the president was saying the other day, he's also thinking, and it's come, it's come to his attention, that interns are just brought in to make coffee and, you know, operate the photocopier. These are people with master's degrees and, um, you know, we, it, it's very shameful that we don't actually have very conscious skills development programs. So, once again, I think it's a question of us working from wherever we are to, to do the right thing, to build the capacity. And yes, I mean, we can't wish political uh, organizations away. Um, I, I hope that some of them really do invigorate and engender the kind of, of skills and thinking within themselves to make sure that those things that happen in political spaces do. But remember, there are also other spaces like the Human Rights Commission, the other authorities, local government, where uh, you are seeing more young people. And it's very pleasing, I think, when I see, ah, oh, there's a student of mine in a local government uh, a structure, um, a student who's a, you know, or a former student who's actually there taking up that space. Um, but there's a huge problem to be uh, addressed in the weaknesses of the, of the education system, and, and that's a, perhaps a, a, a a question for another discussion. 
partnerships also very important. Um, so the NGOs with international partners, um, and and I think the training capacities within the state and outside. It can't be one sector alone, and I'm afraid that's all I can say. To um, uh, Mr. Mbeki, I can say that yes. Um, look. There are those who would have a, perhaps a liberal interpretation of South African historiography who will see, will see that moment of um, political change as a golden moment to actually celebrate all that it, it, it brought with it. But I think um, a kind of radical um, and, and, and um, a review of what we went through has sometimes um, and increasingly uh, started to make its way into the public space. Unfortunately, you know, people, because they sit on uh, different sides of a divide, don't want to hear that narrative. And I think it is very unfortunate. We should actually be prepared to go back and say, well, why aren't we seeing the changes? Maybe it is uh, that interpretation that is uh, the, the right one. So I, I do think that as a society and as a, a, a kind of um, uh, a society we become so polarized that we don't allow for much uh, interactive dialogue. We're not a deliberative democracy, and and I think that your voice and the voice of others. Uh, there have been really interesting, uh, serious economic um, uh, uh, books written about the kind of economic deals that were done at that point. Do need to feature in in our understanding of of history. Um, and I just want to say, perhaps to, to tag on to the uh, uh, colleague at the back who was in law enforcement previously, to say that, yes, you know, he makes very important points, particularly because um, there's no guarantee that with all the prosecutions in the world, state capture won't repeat itself. In fact, uh, for that very reason, we do need to be interrogating uh, the structures and holding them to account um, not only the institutions of Chapter 9, but also the other structures that uh, are part of our constitutional makeup. Hmm. Otilia, the, can, can you deal with the, the one part of Dr. Um, uh, question about trust? How do we rebuild trust in state structures? Is there a way we can uh, try and inject new energy towards uh, building that trust? And you can take any other then. Uh, thank you very much. I'm also mindful that we only have three minutes, so I feel like this is a test. Uh, <laughs> um, when I spoke, I spoke about how it's so much easier to break trust, and that means whether it's the judiciary, whether it's the legislature, uh, or the executive and its many uh, arms, small and big, um, there's a lot more work to actually, like you rightly point out, to actually be able to establish that. Part of it requires actually, depending on the institution, and let me be clear, the, 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 how individuals relate to the police, for example, will differ significantly to how they relate to parliament, which can be a more distant feature to them. And yet it shouldn't be because parliamentarians, uh, just like the police, uh, just like, uh, in part, a little bit less, the judiciary, are products of this very society. What we lack, perhaps, or what we are struggling with, is really uh, setting the, the clear guidelines for a social compact, one that recognizes why these institutions exist and why they matter. What is lacking? A question was posed uh, by um, someone from the SA Human Rights Commission around uh, skills transfer in particular. What is lacking is ensuring that some of those institutions, the best people within those institutions, actually can and do do their job. That they don't spend most of their time talking to the media, quite frankly, but they actually are able to operate. It means getting people to understand the different functions of these institutions. Because trust is not a one-way street, Silo. 
it's not enough for parliament, the executive, the judiciary to do all they can to build trust. People need to be able to actually, on their part, wherever they are, to be able to affirm that for sure. Uh, I see that parliament is working in uh, according to what we said they should do. Um, but it requires professionalism. It requires not only recruiting the right people, but upskilling within those institutions so that the test isn't um, a subjective test, so to speak, but objectively that we can be able to see that the state is working. At the moment, for some people, the state is working. For others, the state is increasingly distant, even as they are geographically close to it. Um, you know, when, when it's your mother's birthday, you can ask to speak again. <laughs> um, I, I was about to close then. In honor of mommy, I have to let Anton speak again. Um, the, and then I was, I was hoping to hear from the devil, but uh, I, we, we've run out of time. Um, so uh, I can see that you're dying to say something as well. You know, so. So, I, so I'm actually not, I'd rather give my, my time to Bologna. I just want to say that these comments about the lack of young people in government, I feel quite offended. I sort of saw myself as one of them. Uh, this remark you made about my hair, I think it's unfair. Uh, I do represent the young authority, so I'd actually like to uh, give my time. You don't want to speak, Bologna? Was that, yeah, I'd actually give my time to, to Bologna, my former boss and mentor. Well, is it on? Okay. No, no, let me just say uh, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Silo. I, I enjoy the, the discussion. It's been very uh, informative. Um, <clears throat> I just want to make two points, because I think some of the people don't know that. <clears throat> Anton here, he, he was working at the uh, Security Council in New York. Uh, at his family there and they abandoned all that to come back and work at the NPA. He had great opportunities there. Uh, he was living a life of privilege, uh, walking and cycling the streets of New York and yet and he decided to come and work in this, in this country and rebuild the NPA. Similarly, with, uh, with Shamila. She was at The Hague, secure job, about to get the citizenship of Netherlands. And she left that and came back to, to work for this country. I'm raising this because it shows a level of commitment and that there are people in this country who still believe in South Africa, who believe in building the rule of law. And that's very encouraging. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much for the sacrifices that you are making. I believe in the future of this country. I still have hope. With people like you, I think we'll go far. Thank you very much. As I hand over to, to months ago, I thought I should uh, um, end on a similar kind of note. I, I tried to count how many times um, Anton used the word hope in his speech. I lost count at around six. Um, so, uh, but he continued. So it means that uh, being in the home of the ancestor of hope, which was Madiba, the ultimate one who, who kind of hoped uh, even when there was no hope at all, uh, it, it means that uh, we should believe in what Anton believes in. Um, that he reminds us that uh, uh, if Madiba had hope, uh, in 69, writing a letter to his children and saying, don't worry about me now. I'm happy. I'm well, full of strength and hope. The letter was written on 13th of uh, February, 1969. Madiba had only served seven years in prison. He still had 20 more years to go. If he was holding on to hope, who are we to lose it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ndate Hatang, and to the panelists. I think it's easier for us to focus our lens on the happenings at the institutions of democracy. 
Um, but as the booming voice that came from the audience of Ndatemwele uh, Tsimbeki saying, maybe we need to take a step back and really look at this trust deficit that we have. Where does it come from? Perhaps it's because the outcomes of the liberations um, are not about the development of the people. But um, perhaps this realization, as Advocate uh, Duplessis said, is an awakening, or should I say this realization of awakening is a deep, deepening and maturation of our democracy. And so here at the Nelson Mandela Foundation, I for one am truly, I feel privileged that uh, we do that work of dealing with these persistent social issues that were um, brought up of power dynamics and economic opportunity, legitimacy of power, of the political agency and how it relates to identity. Was it thrust upon us in 1994? Um, and how, you know, you make the words of the Constitution, as Ms. Otilia said, coherent and, and real for all. So thank you very much for participating in today's dialogue. Uh, we are now going to break up for lunch, and we hope that we will continue to dialogue um, downstairs in the dining area. But before we do that, and if you could assist me, uh, we just have something special to give to our special guests that participated in this discussion. Would like to say thank you very much for taking the time to join us here. They, they will declare it, uh, of course. We have to. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, on behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and our Board of Trustees. Uh, lunch will be served downstairs. If there are any media uh, that would like maybe to get a, a comment or two, please find Moronga. She's at the top of the room there. Um, please uh, to remember to fill out the evaluation forms that we gave you at the beginning of the dialogue. And have a good afternoon.